This is Invincible Career. I'm Larry Cornett. Should you fix a weakness? Now, I think the old school of management training must have told young managers to knock the weaknesses out of their employees because uh, I experienced my fair share of this style of management in the early years of my career. I was mostly given a list of weaknesses that my manager thought I should address. I was frequently reminded of failings that I had to overcome. Even when a boss doesn't tell us to focus on our weaknesses, I think most of us will do it independently. In employee polls several years ago, workers were asked if they thought they should build their strengths or fix their weaknesses to be more successful in their jobs. Only 37% said that focusing on their strengths would help them be more successful. 63% said they should fix their weaknesses first. In a different survey, employees were asked, when you talk with your manager about your performance, what do you spend the most time talking about? 24% said strengths, 36% said weaknesses, and a full 40% said Uh, We don't talk about those things here. Now, I don't remember being coached to double down on my strengths until much later in my career. One of my managers, thank you, Justin, gave me a book by Marcus Buckingham and Kurt Kaufman called First Break All the Rules What the World's Greatest Managers Do Differently. In one chapter, it's chapter five, They talk specifically about how great managers focus on their employees' strengths, not their weaknesses. Now, while this approach is a better way to manage a team and yourself, you can't completely ignore your weaknesses. Eventually, they have to be addressed one way or the other. So the million-dollar question posed by my newsletter is, should you fix a weakness? And the answer is, it depends. It starts with understanding what it means to call something a weakness. Then you must uncover why something is a weakness for you. Finally, you have to assess what fixing that weakness means for you. So, I mean, what is a weakness? We talk about strength and weakness so much that I don't think we give a second thought to what they really mean. So let's take a minute and think about what a weakness is. Buckingham says, a weakness is an activity that makes you feel weak. Even if you're good at it, if it drains you, that's a weakness. So it's a little circular, but I think that final point is key. Even if you're good at doing something, if it drains you, if you don't like it, you just feel destroyed when you're working on it, it's a weakness. There is a difference between a weakness and a non-talent, as Buckingham refers to it. A non-talent only becomes an issue or a weakness when your performance depends on tapping into it. Otherwise, you could ignore it for your entire life. I can think of many, many things that I'm not good at doing, and I never will be. I also don't care about most of those missing talents and skills. But I know that some of those items were moved into the weakness column when I was an employee. And it really comes down to a mismatch between expectations and reality. When I think back on my time as a corporate manager and leader, which I did for many, many years, almost 20 years, you know, working in Silicon Valley, you know, we have a set of performance and behavioral expectations for our employees based on their role, their level, and their experience. When a specific employee can't meet those expectations, we identify the associated activity as a weakness or, quote, an area for improvement. And that's the the new and improved way to refer to a weakness. It's not a weakness. It's an area for improvement. Now, some managers want their employees to address weaknesses simply because they exist. They represent this gap between expectations and execution, They want a specific level of performance in that job. Therefore, the employee must address the issue. Of course, our own perceptions of our weaknesses don't only exist in the workplace. 
You may identify a specific weakness as a mismatch between your personal goals and the reality of your performance. You know, I gave the example, maybe, maybe you love playing basketball, but your three point shots are a bit of a weakness, <laughs> you know, uh, true for a lot of people. You have higher expectations for yourself than you're able to deliver on the court. So for you, that's a weakness. Now you have to think about why is something a weakness. I don't think anyone is born with a natural strength at 100% of its full potential at birth. Even the most talented people that we observe have practiced for years to develop their skills. So they look like amazing strengths now. There is a difference between a weakness and an undiscovered talent. Something that might be labeled as a weakness may simply be a talent that you've never bothered to explore before. Similarly, an area for improvement looks a lot like an undeveloped strength. Is it really a weakness? Or is it just a skill you need to develop or knowledge you should acquire? Understanding why something is a weakness is essential before making any decisions about what you're going to do about it. You have to dig deeper to identify root causes. For example, maybe you do lack skills, knowledge, and experience. That's why it's a weakness. That can be addressed. That's easily remedied. Maybe you're afraid. Maybe you're afraid of doing something, and that's why it's become a weakness. And this is more challenging to overcome. It's not simple skill acquisition, but it is possible to push through your fear and get to the other side of it. Or finally, you know, you're missing the required talent or trait or capability, and you're never going to have it. It's not a skill. It's not knowledge. It's not experience. It's, it's a core trait or talent. Trying to address a weakness that has this root cause, it's only going to result in frustration and misery. And a lot of people fall into that trap. So then think about what lies on the other side of this weakness. Given that you will most likely see a larger ROI, return on the investment, by leveraging a strength versus trying to improve a weakness, this is a critical question to ask. What lies on the other side of fixing this weakness? Will you personally benefit? Or will someone else benefit? Or will your company or your employer benefit? So ask yourself, how does addressing this weakness serve me? Not my boss, not the company, me. It is valuable to work on an area for improvement when it serves you well. When something valuable that you want is on the other side of fear, it's worth investing in removing that obstacle. When a weakness blocks something that will help you achieve your goals, and you can actually do something about it, it's worth working on it. However, sometimes you are asked, or I should say forced, (laughs) to to work on a weakness purely for the benefit of your employer. It doesn't come naturally for you. It will never feel like a strength and you don't want to do it. But your job description requires you to overcome that weakness or you're going to risk being fired or terminated. Now, this is hard to admit, but if an employment situation sets you up for focusing on your weaknesses, and not leveraging your strengths, you need a new job. It's miserable to work for someone who does nothing but focus on your supposed shortcomings. And they're constantly trying to get you to change. Many people are unhappy because they're stuck in jobs that don't tap into their potential and they force them to struggle with their weaknesses every single day. So I guess it it shouldn't be surprising that 81% of employees are considering leaving their jobs. 70% of them aren't working to their full potential. I guess that shouldn't be surprising. 
So when you're considering what to do about a weakness, start with your assessment of how much it matters in your life. Some weaknesses may be harming your professional development. Some may be interfering with achieving happiness in your personal life. But some issues will mean absolutely nothing to you. The strategic approach you take with a weakness varies based on how important it is for you, your future, and if something valuable is waiting for you on the other side of it. So first, you could choose to ignore the weakness. I should say probably ignore the non-talent. So if you, you lack the talent or skills or knowledge in a specific area, but you care nothing about it, it's not really a weakness. And it's certainly not a weakness worth improving. We have thousands and thousands of non-talents. One of my sons kind of ironically brought it up tonight. <laughs> he, was, he was talking about the fact that I'm not tall enough to be a Division I college volleyball player. <laughs> I was like, where did this come from? He's applying to colleges, so I guess he was looking into it because my sons are pretty tall. Now, guess how much I care about my so-called weakness, my height weakness, when it comes to qualifying as a collegiate volleyball player? I mean, absolutely zero. <laughs> I just don't care. And I'm sure you have weaknesses and non-talents that you don't care about as well. Don't waste a single minute thinking about them. Don't waste any time thinking about it. So the next level that you could do with a weakness is to manage it. Manage the weakness. The best leaders help their employees intelligently manage weaknesses while focusing on getting the most out of their strengths. Some skills or behaviors aren't part of your core job description, but they can become annoying distractions and they can derail progress when you struggle with them. And I was thinking about some employees I had that just could not get to meetings on time. You know, being in a meeting wasn't really part of their core job, but it was important enough that it was harming their professional career. You can do this for yourself as well. If you don't have a boss who's helping you or if it's something personal, if a weakness is getting in your way and you don't necessarily have to get better at it, you don't have to work on it. There are different strategies you can leverage to manage it and make it a non-issue. For example, you could restructure your processes to work around the weakness, take it out of the flow. You could set up a support system to help you manage it. I have a problem that I get too focused on a task. Like if I'm writing and in the old days when I used to prototype and I would lose track of time. I wouldn't notice that it's like, oh, I'm late for a meeting. I should have left a half hour ago. So having a calendar that pops up a reminder helps me a lot. And I use it that way. It helps me remember to, to context switch and to get on track with what comes next so I don't lose uh, track and I don't miss a meeting. You could hire an assistant to handle a task. People do that. If you can, delegate it to someone who's better at it. You know, if you're a manager and you're bad at doing something, delegate a task to someone on your team who's great at it. Or you could partner with someone who compliments you. They balance your strengths and weaknesses. Now, the next strategy is to reduce a weakness. In some cases, it is worth reducing or eliminating the negative impact of a weakness. You know, if you find that you can't ignore it, you can't work around it, and you know you can't turn it into a strength. But maybe you can kind of sand off the rough edges. And I'll give you an example from my professional life. As I've mentioned before, I'm very introverted. My networking skills are a weakness. I know it. They continue to be a weakness. That type of social activity just doesn't come naturally to me. When I engage in traditional networking, I feel drained and it takes days for me to recover. <laughs> it really does. I need days of solitude to recover. And I wish I were exaggerating, but I'm not. It takes me two or three days to recover from something like a conference. However, I run my own business and professional networking is a must for me. When I force myself to be more social, it does help me attract new clients. I know this. I see it all the time. 
when I withdraw and I pull back and I stop being social and I stop networking, that's my natural tendency. My business suffers every time. I see that too. Networking and being social, it's never going to be a strength for me. It's just not part of my personality. But I can't ignore it. And I can't really fully delegate it either. The way my business is running, I can't delegate that to someone else. So I strategically engage. I use various techniques to connect with people to reduce that negative impact of the weakness as much as I can. And then another step you can take is to embrace a weakness. When you let someone else tell you what your weaknesses are, which happens, <laughs> happens a lot with bosses, right? You lose power. When you try to mask a weakness that you have given more importance than it deserves, you start to suffer from imposter syndrome. And I've talked about that before. My weakness of supposedly being too compassionate when I was a corporate executive became a strength when I became an executive coach. I decided to embrace it instead of trying to eliminate it. I claimed it instead of trying to hide it. I took away the power from, you know, it was a few of my past bosses, not all of them, who told me that being kind was a weakness. <laughs> you know, kindness is a weakness. Got to be, got to be rougher, got to be tougher, got to be more political. So I, I redefined my career. I changed my role in this world to play to my strengths. And maybe it's just my belief, but I think the world has enough cruel people running around. What this world needs is more people who care. We need more people who are trying to help other people. So I chose a new path for myself. One day you may find that you're tired of managing a weakness that you can fit into a job that is no longer serving you well. So you may choose to lean into it, accept your so-called weakness, <laughs> and create a new path that unleashes your full potential. And then finally, I added this one because I think you can transform a weakness into a strength. And I know that's rare or supposedly can't happen, but I think we sometimes have weaknesses that are actually undiscovered talents and undeveloped strengths. They are only weaknesses because we've never bothered to explore what would happen if we did invest in them. I did this with public speaking. You know, I've talked about this before. And in my case, I had avoided it because of fear. I had a fear of failure, fear of judgment, fear of looking foolish in front of other people in the room. And I decided finally that this was a weakness that I had to fix. I could tell that it was holding me back in my professional career. I did this exercise. I looked on the other side of fear and I saw how much public speaking could transform my life, especially professionally. I witnessed successful leaders who could calmly take the stage and happily engage with audiences. Saw a lot of that. I watched people in my industry have their careers take off because they were completely comfortable presenting in front of a room and at a conference, and on stage, and workshops. So I decided to stop hiding from it. I stopped avoiding it. I stopped working around it. And initially, I think I just wanted to slightly improve this weakness so that I could tolerate speaking in front of other people. I just wanted to be less nervous, kind of get rid of the butterflies. And something funny happened along the way. I ended up falling in love with public speaking. It took a few years, but I transformed this weakness that was driven by fear into one of my most valuable strengths. Perhaps the latent potential had always been there. I don't know. But I'd never tapped into it. Maybe that's what was going on. I don't know. But I'm glad that I did. And I saved this section for last because I think there are times that you can invest in something that you may have 
incorrectly defined as a weakness. Maybe you misidentified it as a weakness. And you have an opportunity to turn it into something great. But only you can see the potential of making that investment. This isn't for someone else to do. This isn't for a boss to tell you. This is, this is for you. You're the only one who truly understands what lies on the other side of your fear. And I included a, a quote from George Adair. Everything you've ever wanted is on the other side of fear. So if you would like to read this newsletter and check out some of the links that I included in it, it's at newsletter.invinciblecareer.com. Pretty easy to find it and the past archives. And yeah, I I wish you luck with this. Um, I think there are times that you need to address your weaknesses. They can hold you back. And sometimes it may be something that you could transform into something that is uh, pretty wonderful for you. Until next time, I wish you the best of luck in becoming an opportunity magnet for the best things in life.